It happens to the best of us. Every time we hear Gucci, we immediately think of red carpets and crystal champagne. As the brand now stands as the pinnacle of fashion excellence with its staggering earnings of $20.6 billion. But, it's important not to be misled by the shiny surface. The true story begins in a place far from glamour and takes a deep dive back into those humble beginnings. Unraveling a narrative filled with more unexpected developments than a dramatic television series. Imagine a scenario where a simple family effort transforms into an epic tale brimming with avarice, conflicts over finances, legal disputes, ambitious schemes to seize power, and even an instance of homicide. So, get comfortable, as we're about to unfold the intricate and surprising history of Gucci in greater detail. Let's start with the protagonist of our story, Guccio Gucci, a man hailing from Florence, Italy, who once assisted in his family's struggling straw hat business. Left penniless after the venture failed, he departed at the age of 18 to seek fortune in London, where he found work at the upscale Savoy Hotel. This job brought him into contact with the high society, exposing him to their luxurious leather goods and sophisticated suitcases. For Guccio, these items symbolized more than mere travel essentials. They represented a gateway to a realm of affluence and exclusivity to which he aspired to belong. Fueled by grand ambitions, Guccio transitioned to working for a railway company, dealing extensively with passengers' luggage and gaining deeper insights into the world of opulence. He thought to himself, if I could tap into selling this kind of premium merchandise, I could make a fortune, aware that success wouldn't come instantly. He dedicated himself to the long haul, persevering through the hardships of World War I and dedicating time to mastering the leather. Craftsmanship By 1921, now 40 years old, Cuccio had managed to save enough funds to open a small shop in Florence, marking the inception of what would eventually escalate into the renowned Gucci dynasty. At the outset, Cuccio maintained a cautious approach, importing products, however, his affluent clientele soon began requesting more distinctive, handmade pieces, seizing the opportunity. He thought, why not create these items myself? Consequently, he established a workshop, assembling a team to satisfy the high-end demands. However, the challenge was greater than anticipated. The business expanded rapidly, as did the financial burdens. Overwhelmed, Guccio found himself in a constant state of stress ultimately resorting to borrowing money from his son-in-law just to stay afloat. Guccio was content with crafting and selling his exquisite leather creations, but his sons harbored grander aspirations. They convinced their father to expand by opening another outlet in Rome. Guccio was hesitant, viewing the expansion as overly ambitious, but he eventually consented, a decision that proved fortuitous as the Rome store flourished, particularly during World War II as customers sought luxurious gifts for their loved ones. Encouraged by this success, the Gucci family inaugurated additional stores, one in Milan during the 1950s and later venturing overseas to New York City. Tragically, Guccio passed away from a heart attack just two weeks after the grand opening of the New York establishment, marking the end of one chapter and the beginning of another in the storied legacy of Gucci. The story he began was passed on to his three sons, but his daughter Grima LDA was left out entirely, receiving nothing from the inheritance despite the fact that it was her husband's financial support that once rescued the company from collapse. Grima LDA attempted to challenge this decision in court, but her efforts were in vain as she ended up without any part of the family business. Meanwhile, the Gucci venture in the United States flourished, becoming the first high-end Italian brand to make its mark in New York. Celebrities in Hollywood quickly became enamored with the brand, sparking a widespread desire for Gucci products among the general public. For some time, the brothers operated the business without major issues. However, when Vasco passed away in 1974, his widow inherited his share of the company. The surviving brothers, Aldo and Rodolfo, promptly bought her out, thereby becoming joint leaders of the company. In the same year, they ambitiously expanded Gucci into the Hong Kong market, a move that significantly bolstered their presence in Asia. Their expansion did not stop there. They ventured into the fragrance market and continuously expanded the Gucci product line. 
Gucci evolved from a brand known mainly for its travel bags into a comprehensive luxury brand. With worldwide recognition, yet it remained a family-owned enterprise. The drama continued as all those three sons, Giorgio, Roberto, and Paolo, each received a part of their father as share, while their uncle Rodolfo clung tightly to his portion, not sharing any of it with his son, Maurizio. The tension among the cousins over who would ultimately control the Gucci empire was constant. Aldo and Rodolfo may have established a significant fashion brand, but as they aged, the battle for succession grew more intense. Then there was Maurizio's wife, Patriz Iaregianai, who reveled in the luxurious Gucci lifestyle. She had a preference for the comforts of wealth, famously valuing tears in a Rolls Royce over happiness on a bicycle. And she was not timid about her desire for her husband to dominate the family business. She became notorious for escalating the family discord. Although Rodolfo criticized her as a gold digger, Maurizio, blinded by love, ignored these warnings. Their tumultuous marriage only intensified the existing family disputes. Upon Rodolfo's death, Maurizio gained control of half the company. But this did not quell the familial disputes, especially regarding business strategies. With Gucci merchandise becoming increasingly common, Maurizio believed that the brand was losing its exclusivity. He decided to retract certain licensing agreements, a decision that initially cost the company financially, but is believed by some to have ultimately preserved Gucci's luxury status. Meanwhile, Paolo felt marginalized, having been given minimal control and little respect within the family. He aspired to become the leading designer for Gucci. But his ambitions were not supported by his relatives. In an act of defiance, Paolo reported his father Aldo to the authorities for tax evasion, resulting in Aldo's imprisonment. Paolo's attempts to establish his own brand were disastrous, losing millions and meeting with resistance from his family, who were concerned he might tarnish the Gucci reputation. Even Paolo's daughter criticized his initial designs, deeming them unattractive. The Gucci family frequently made headlines due to their incessant quarrels, lawsuits, and personal vendettas. Maurizio grew tired of the constant noise and conflict and sought to take full control by partnering with InvestCorp, a significant investment firm. Paolo, once an important figure within the company, became estranged, holding only a minor stake. In 1988, he sold his small share to Invest Corp for $40 million, subsequently squandering the fortune and sinking into poverty and debt. So, Maurizio convinced the remaining family members to sell their shares to Invest Corp, effectively removing the family from the company's management while he remained at the helm. With the family gone, Maurizio and his new executive, Don Mello, aimed to restore the brand's prestige. They reduced the number of stores and products, bringing back classic items like the bamboo bag and Gucci loafers to revitalize the brand's exclusive image. He harbored grand ambitions for Gucci, investing heavily in a lavish store in Milan and seeking to overhaul the brand completely, which led to significant financial strain. He even considered discontinuing the accessories line, a major source of revenue and eliminating the iconic GG logo, a move that would eliminate a substantial portion of the company's sales. His decisions were polarizing, risking the brand as financial stability in pursuit of an unparalleled level of exclusivity. Maurizio's drastic changes led to Gucci losing $30 million annually. The company was struggling to stay afloat, unable to pay its workers or settle its bills, edging dangerously close to bankruptcy. This situation caused significant worry for the folks at InvestCorp, the investment firm that had sunk a lot of money into Gucci. They watched with growing concern as their investment seemed to falter and suggested that it might be time to appoint a new CEO to turn things around. Despite this, Maurizio remained adamant that his strategies would eventually bear fruit if given more time. InvestCorp's patience ran thin, and by 1993, they decided to take action, buying Maurizio out of the company for a hefty sum of $150 million. Remarkably, just six months after Maurizio's departure, Gucci began to show signs of recovery, particularly in the Japanese market. 
it appeared that some of Maurizio's initially questioned strategies were starting to contribute positively to the brand's resurgence and luxury status. However, Maurizio was no longer involved in the company. For the first time in history, there was no member of the Gucci family at the helm of the brand. And just two years after his exit from Gucci, Maurizio's life met a tragic end. The stormy relationship between Maurizio and his wife Pat Rizia finally led to their separation. Following their divorce in 1994, Pat Rizia seemed more distressed over losing the prestigious Gucci name than the end of her marriage. However, she was infuriated, making Maurizio's life miserable with relentless angry phone calls. Maurizio tried to move forward with his life, finding love again with Paola. But Pat Rizia was relentless. Fearing that Maurizio's new relationship and potential new family would cut off the lavish lifestyle, her divorce settlement afforded her. In a shocking turn of events in 1995, Maurizio was brutally murdered, shot three times in the head on his way to work. The dramatic nature of his personal life meant that there were numerous potential suspects. However, the investigation hit a standstill until an unexpected tip led directly to Pat Rizia. It emerged that she had been openly inquiring about ways to eliminate her ex-husband while avoiding incarceration, even involving her friend Pina in the search for a hitman. Pat Rizia didn't shy away from the limelight at her trial, dressing extravagantly in Gucci attire for the courtroom cameras. She was ultimately sentenced to 29 years in prison, with the actual gunman receiving a life sentence. However, Pat Rizia was released after serving 18 years, turning down an opportunity for earlier work release by famously declaring she had never worked a day in her life. After Maurizio Gucci's death, the brand Gucci began doing really well, thanks a lot to hiring Tom Ford as the main designer. He made Gucci popular again, especially with young people. Together with CEO Domenico De Sol, they made a great team and doubled Gucci's sales from $163 million to $500 million in just one year. With past family problems no longer affecting the business, Gucci could grow and try new things. Investcorp, seeing how well Gucci was doing, decided to make the company public, which turned out to be a huge success, making the billion dollars. They sold their shares at the right time because, in 1997, Gucci's stock price fell when the luxury market in Japan went down. This drop made it easier for Bernard Arnault from LVMH, who likes to buy luxury brands, to get Gucci shares cheaper, leading to new challenges for Gucci. Gucci then looked for other companies to work with to get stronger and added more big fashion names to its group, becoming part of what's now called Karenji. Under new management, Gucci kept up with trends, expanded around the world, and managed to keep a good balance between being exclusive, but still reachable to people. Now, with millions of followers on social media and many stores all over, Gucci is still a big name in fashion. The movie house of Gucci brought back interest in the brand's dramatic history. Even though the Gucci family didn't like how they were shown in the movie, interestingly, this attention may have helped Gucci sell more, showing that people are still very interested in the brand even though the family isn't involved in it anymore. At the same time, Bernard Arnault kept on with his efforts and managed to take over Louis Vuitton, adding a new story to the competition in the luxury fashion world. If you found this interesting, please like and subscribe for deeper dives into exciting topics. Your likes and subscriptions support our work.